Hello there, one and all, and welcome to episode 392 of Love at First Send with me, Persil Ace, coming to you live on YouTube. As always, thank you very much for tuning in. Whether you're watching live or you're watching the recording, you are very, very welcome. Our first video for September, the return of a Love at First Send following the summer break has well and truly taken place. I think the summer break is now a distant memory. And the first comment, the first comment for this video is actually an emoji. It's Ty waving. Gavin is here as well saying, you hoo and Joe. M68 says, afternoon, Mr. P. Hope you've been enjoying the return of summer here in the UK. Well, yes, yeah, summer has returned down here to the south as well, but no, there hasn't been much time for enjoyment. Not that I can, you know, I really, really mustn't complain because I had plenty of opportunities to enjoy sunshine over the course of the last few weeks. Thank you very much, all of you, for tuning in. If you haven't already subscribed to this channel, please do consider doing so. And if you're going to do that, you may want to click on the little bell so that you get notifications about new videos. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you would like to find out how you can support my work, you should be able to see a link to my coffee page in the video description below. Okay. Ta-da! I think you can work out from the display next to me that this is going to be a, a multi-perfume feature-length video with some new and newish releases for September. What are people saying so far? Uh, Ty says, now I'm smiling but still waving, as long as you're not drowning. Um, Paolo says, hello everyone, glad to catch one of these again. Helter Skelter Jones says, wonderful afternoon for Penhalicans. Orange blooms, yes. Now, did somebody tell me that Orange Blossom might be getting discontinued. I need to look into this because I was assured that it is so successful and so popular that it is absolutely nowhere near on the verge of being discontinued. And then somebody also informed me that Garland's Herba Fresca might be getting discontinued, which I found even more shocking. So all of you out there with contacts and connections and people in your networks, go and find out if that's true. Angie says, Mr. P, live on my birthday, best present ever. <laughs> Probably not, but that's very, very kind. And happy birthday to you. Everybody send happy birthday thoughts to Angie, wherever you are in the world. Uh, Andre says, good afternoon, Persilase, and all in the chat. Sent Genie says, not Herba Fresca. I, I know, I, that that I find imp just, just beyond belief. The thing is, I know that if I contact the brand, they'll be very, very cagey and, and won't tell me until, until all the bottles are gone. And, you know, on, on personalaise.com over on the blog, a few weeks ago, I posted a review of Jardin Après la Mousson from Hermès, uh, which, which I was told was getting discontinued. I could not find a single bottle of it for love nor money anywhere in France this summer. So I, I, I think, I think it, it is gone. Might as well discontinue Chalamar, says Pradeep. Yes. Oh, Angie tells us where, where she is. Virginia near Washington, D.C. OK, everyone think... East Coast of America. That is right. Washington, D.C. is on the East Coast. <laughs> yeah, my geography of these states. Sending, anyway, generally send some, some birthday wishes in the direction of, of the United States. Okay, we have got quite a few that we want to get through today. So I had, uh, I'd better, I'd better stop digressing and get going. And I think, I, I think we need to start this. I think we need to start with the new Dior. Uh, this is a new version of J'adore. I think this is the 3418th uh, version of, ja no, probably 3419th version of J'adore that uh, Dior have given us. This is called J'adore Lore. Um, Madame Persilaise and I uh, saw this and had a sniff of it in France a few weeks ago. And <laughs> Madame Persilaise's first observation was, oh, look, they've changed the thingy. And by the thingy, she made this bit. And yes, they have changed the thingy. I, 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 I think, I think this is a, one of the more fetching thingies. It's, it's on a sort of slant, which means that you have to click the thingy into place properly. And this, I think, uh, even though it was available, it's been available in France for a little while. I think it was, um, it, it went nationwide in the UK um, on Friday. Um, but what makes this one? certainly more interesting than a lot of the other Jadors we've had in recent years, um, is that this is the first one by Francis Kirchia, okay? Uh, and that does genuinely make it interesting. Uh, Francis Kirchia, as you will know, was appointed in-house perfumer at Dior a little while ago, and we haven't had a, um, a, a major kind of high-profile new release from him yet. One of the first things that he did 
was that he went to the Collection Privée and 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 brought out Au Noir uh, in the, the original kind of trio of colognes um, that he and Anique Minardo had worked on. Then earlier this year, we had the first fully standalone new Collection Privée for him, which I reviewed uh, on this channel. That was called Dior Riviera. And now he's giving us his take on uh, J'adore. I'm, I'm sure the powers that be are getting closer and closer to a, a, a totally new creation from him. Um, incidentally, in, in, in the kind of spirit of the way we're doing these things at the moment, we don't have written blotter updates anymore. At least that's, that's how things are right now. I have sp pre-sprayed all of these, even though I haven't pre-smelt them before. Uh, certainly three of these I hadn't had a sniff of before, but I pre-sprayed them about an hour ago, so I'm going to do a kind of fresh smell and then the smell of the blotter that was done about an hour and a half ago. So let me let me spray the, the Dior. Um, I read an interview not that long ago with Kirchion in which he said that he was around when um, Calis Becker made the original Jador. Now, bit of context, original Jador um, came out in 1999, composed by Calis Becker, of course, and I remember being really, really taken with it. I thought it was a great mainstream uh, jasmine, a really, really good scent for Dior, jasmine and orange blossom and white florals in that kind of symphonic shimmering way that Calis Becker knows how to do so well. Um, she'd done a similar thing, or no, sorry, she did a similar thing for Estee Lauder a few years later with Beyond Paradise, but that didn't turn out to be terribly successful. Tragically, I think, because I was always a huge fan of Beyond Paradise. I think I preferred Beyond Paradise to J'adore. But J'adore did extremely well. Uh, lots of flankers came along. And then over the years, uh, Francois Demachy put his own stamp on it, the then in-house perfumer at Dior. And, 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 and I haven't much liked J'adore. There was a J'adore Absolu that came out not long after the original. That was that was really beautiful. That was stunning. You know, it, it was it was it was definitely I think um, better than the original. Uh, and since then, there was there was a there was a J'adore oil that came out a few years ago that was pretty good. I think the Infinissime. I can't even remember. I mean, there have been some that have been better than others, but overall, it's felt like a line that just really needed a kind of re-energizing and, and, and a return to its roots, uh, a, a return to what made it great. Now, my initial sniff of this one in France, I have to say, was positive, but I didn't really have an opportunity to let it get to dry down stage. Um, so here we go. Um, whoops, don't drop the blotter. This is Francis Kirchian's take on J'adore, called J'adore l'or, and this is an essence de parfum, whatever that means. Sister Parfum says, so is this again a new version of the lower version? Sister Parfum, who knows? Who knows? We've got so many Dior arms, we've got so many Miss Dior's. I, th I think part of it is almost like deliberately being done to confuse us. Um, okay. Right. So in whatever perfumery we happened to be in in France a few weeks ago when I smelt this, whether it was a Sephora or a Galerie Lafayette or a Pantone or a, or a Nochi Bay, whatever it was, it was one of those. Um, the initial impression was really, really pleasant, really positive, and also very, very Kirchian, in the sense that he's almost kind of thought, okay, I suppose I need to do a kind of sheer, translucent, light-filled jasmine thing here, but I would like to take things in the direction of Orange Blossom because he he really, really does love Orange Blossom. If he has a signature note, it is Orange Blossom. Um, and it's it, it, it feels so much more naturalistic than some of the more recent Jadors that we've had. It's, it, it isn't particularly striking. It isn't particularly bold. It isn't particularly dramatic. But, you know, Madame Persilaise and I both smelt this and, and almost sort of heaved a sigh of relief because she, back in the day, was, was a fan of, of J'adore, um, and particularly of the Absolu version. She wore it all the way through a holiday that we had in India many years ago, and that became very much the, the, the scent of, of that holiday, and that jasmine worked so beautifully in, in the Indian context. Um, and 
This one, oh, Thomas says, I tried it at a local shop recently and found it pleasant, but a bit forgettable. Yes, I, I think I agree with you. Not very dissimilar to the original Jador. Well, see, may, maybe what's happened as well is that things have moved on. I mean, you know, it's, it's well over two decades since we had the original Jador, and maybe now we expect something a bit different from um, a mainstream release. Um, it's... It, it, it's, there's not a huge amount you can say about it because it is sort of jasmine and orange blossom, full of light, and I suppose quite golden hued. Um, let's check out the press release and then we will smell the pre-sprayed blotter. The press release, I had a quick look. It's a PDF. Um, it's very, very long. What's this comment here? Ty says, it feels less like a warm hug from a person as the 17 and 12 versions were. Gosh, you know them well. This time it feels like a warm hug from the sun, from nature. Very simplistic though. Yeah, I'll go along with that description. I, I, th I think you're sort of being taken off uh, being taken off on flights of imagery much more than I am with this particular one. Anyway, the new Dior fragrance by Francis Kirchion. Dior is a land to be explored and a heritage to embrace. Like all those before him who revisited the curve of the bar suit or reinvented a legendary scent, Francis Kirchion is in turn diving into the soul of Dior. J'adore was essential for him. He was faced with the icon and the flowers of this fragrance, which single-handedly symbolizes luxury, triumphant femininity, and the pioneering soul of Dior. It was an introduction representing a sensual renewal, which he handled with humility and audacity, interesting, determination and vision, guided by the words of Dior, respect tradition and dare to be bold. J'adore led to a special encounter between a perfumer famed for his astonishing creations of polished beauty and an emblematic fragrance that has become a major classic. This was the occasion for him to make his mark on it in his singular style that has garnered success through its eminently contemporary, powerful refinement. He chose to go to the very heart of Jador's floral bouquet, the essence of its incredibly complex formula. There he imbued it with his conceptual sensitivity, taking a radical olfactory position, pruning the floral profusion, he drew a silhouette that leans towards radical minimalism, organic sensuality, and an unprecedented concentration level. Okay, well, I don't know about radical minimalism. Okay. Like gold melted down to retain only its purest essence, he isolated flowers, exaggerating them in a refinement that became its new signature, so that j'adore l'or becomes an or de j'adore, brimming with meaning and depth. So is it j'adore l'or or or de j'adore? Um, for j'adore, Francis Kirchion became a seeker of gold. Let's now try and get to something a bit more prosaic. I'm just going to scan to see where we start getting... Okay, th these are some notes here. With the concept defined, the new style takes shape. Kirchion approaches the floral bouquet in two steps, first refining the formula to better discern it, then celebrating the flowers played in a major key. He streamlines the one in order to elevate the other. I've just seen Stephen's comment. Uh, Laure de Jador undergoes a transformation celebrating a gigantic floral aspect, it was minimal a while ago, floral aspect that is literally extraordinary. Literally. Literally. The bouquet is renewed, updated, carried by flowers, pushed to their maximum, and masterfully overdosed. Moving from the myriad to the streamlined, Francis Kirchhoff creates a radical transformation as though he were moving from pointillism to contemporary art. Gosh, this, this press release is working hard for something that actually maybe should have been marketed slightly differently, you know, like every day, J'adore. Uh, Lord de Jador undergoes a transfer. Oh, sorry, I've read that bit. Jasmine and Rose are extrapolated and are both round and striking. Lily of the Valley and Violet shine and rejoice. <laughs> the, flor <laughs> the florals of the new bouquet are immediate and direct. Tracking forward, zooming in, their beauty is revealed full scale on the screen. Gosh, lots of mixed images here. Um, like warm gold rippling over the skin, a fluid, smooth liquid gleams golden, the soft sensation of a finger touching the tip of a velvet petal. 
or the curve. This is too much to be. Anyway, move on. Or the curve of a shoulder offered to a generous son. Uh, Lord de Jador created. So is it Lord de Jador? Because the packaging says it's Jador Lord. Anyway, um, created by Francis Church on is a sensual, sensorial, and dazzling pleasure. So on and so forth. And where is. Um, oh, and then and then and then some words from him. Christian Jaw used to say that his models represented all the women, women in the world. Thanks to the intact magic and the power of Jador, I dared to imagine that I, in turn, was taking possession of all the flowers in the world, with all the audacity, the extravagance, and the rigor that are the signature of the Dior spirit. I wanted to move from the aura of Jador to that of Lord de Jador, and to its olfactory quintessence, free of all superfluous elements, and so on and so forth. Sensual rose, powerful jasmine. Uh, I added touches of rounder, smoother color by emphasizing pinks and whites and highlighting the solar flowers. Very, very 2023. Uh, exaggerated floral contours. And I suppose that is pretty much it. Oh, and the Lord de Jador Amphora was designed as a precious bottle that one owns so as to always have it nearby. Okay, designed to last, its lid graced with noble materials becomes a real talisman that can be kept over time to house new perfume droplets dedicated solely to the parfum concentration. The minimalist glass body of the Lord de Jador Amphora will be available as a refill from March 2024. I don't really quite know what they're going on there. Um, and then something about a special amphora i would like to know what could somebody please go okay because there's no pricing information here could somebody maybe please just quickly go on the at least uh, oh no i have got pricing information so the 50 mils is a hundred and forty four pounds 144 pounds for 50 mils ain't cheap that is ain't that is not cheap and Tripti says these big perfume house releases are almost as ridiculous as the names of the big pharma drugs. Yeah, I have a feeling that one didn't need to. It, it, it's kind of hyping it up to, in 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 a way that it doesn't need to be. Right, where is my pre-sprayed Dior? Okay, here we go. So what's it? What's it doing? Yeah, it definitely. That's how can I put this? It's it's more unremarkable than the opening. Um, the opening, the opening at least has has got that brightness, has got the luminosity. It comes to you with a great big smile. It comes to you with the sense of stepping into your day with, with with that with that kind of very 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 kind of easy white linen blouse breezy kind of feel, but the. But you would you would want I think you would want a more interesting a more substantial dry down the dry, the, the dry down is 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 very much the the florals starting to feel quite wan quite watered down and and I had a feeling I had a feeling from the opening that that is um, that that is what might happen oh Rachel says one hundred percent Mr P where it is lacking is the dry down ah so you've smelt it yeah. It's extra range near enough, says Gavin. Uh, that's niche pricing, says Sir C. R. Sniffington. Is it a limited release? A limited edition release, says Pradeep. I don't know actually. There's nothing here to say that it's not limited edition. But you know, if it, it if it doesn't sell, it'll go. And Stephen says 140 pounds for 50 mils of a mainstream release. Jabhor. <laughs> Uh, okay, we need to move on because we're nearly at the 20 minute mark, and I've only done the one cent. Yeah, that's a bit it's a bit disappointing, really. Okay, let's go to one that I haven't smelt at all, and I have a press release for it as well, and it's new from Piguet, and it's called Rue du Rue du Cirque, and I don't know. Maybe we will find out if that street name is. Um, uh, relevant to Piguet. Rachel says, still about the Dior, I love my bottle of the original, so I purchased the new one right away. It's a cleaned up version that doesn't last. Uh, that's a shame. That is a shame. It's a real, real shame. Um, this one intrigues me, says Ty. It intrigues me as well, um, because uh, I think I think Piguet are doing some interesting things, and I keep meaning to give them um, some more time. Uh, 
Somebody's just asked me, um, have you smelled Piguet's Zazen, says Maché. Yes, I'm pretty sure I reviewed it on this channel, so just do a little search. Um, Sister Parfum says, yes, it's located in the 8th arrondissement of Paris. Uh, what's this called again? It's called Rue du Cirque, so Cirque Street, Circus Street. Uh, I keep meaning to get some of my bottles of the modern Piguet's and do a kind of showcase of them, because it's a brand that they're doing some really, really interesting things. You know, they have some perfumes out which are really quite out there and which I know they've released just because the creative forces in the, in the, the brand found them disturbing or challenging. And they thought, OK, well, let's go with it, which is um, which is I, I, I think I think I think a commendable, a praiseworthy approach to take. So this I know nothing about. I have a pre-sprayed blotter. Um, so let's go for it. I'll see. Starting the month with a genuine kind of haven't smelt this before type release. Oh, okay. So this one. My very, 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 very first impression of it, obviously, I've, I haven't smelt it before and I've just sprayed it, so that's a bit of a redundant thing to say to you, is that it's kind of... I wonder if it's kind of going to be doing a, a, a sort of Arabian rose thing, Arabian leathery rose. Not what I was expecting from that name, but something kind of dry, almost kind of like dusty fenugreeky coming through as well. But it's also not that huge somehow i i kind of I, I sort of expect piguet with just not expect associate piguet with great big sillage and maybe this is another one where we're going to see the the volume not turned down so there's there's something there's something very aqueous about the rose as well almost as though it's kind of got sort of dewy petals maybe a bit a, a, a feel of raspberry coming through it's quite fleshy there's something oozing about, excuse me, about the rose as well. Intriguing. Is it? Is it? Is it about the kind of tension between east and west? And I've been smelling, um, I've been smelling Amouage's dear, dear women, woman, quite a lot lately, and 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 that, of course, is a, is a really kind of grand, grand aldehydic rose, really, really beautiful Amouage. Um, but this is kind of making me think of like a very, 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 very quiet, non-aldehydic version of it. It's intriguing. Very, very, very intriguing. Um, let's let's just let that. Um, are you sure it isn't geranium, says Gavin? And no, I'm not sure, but uh, but I don't get mintiness per se. Let's see what we can tell you about it. Uh, OK, brief press release. Um, wet cobbles, sweet macarons, actually it says macaroons, but I'm going to help them and can change that to macarons. Vibrant nights and lazy mornings. This is Paris love and this is loving Paris. A heartbeat away from the Champs-Elysees, the small Rue du Cirque whistles a romantic melody. Tiny flower shops, hidden cafes, and of course the jazz clubs and all our speakeasies that this city is known for. But for Piguet, Rue de Cirque was also where his love affair with France began, where he set up his first small atelier and poured his creative genius into everything he did. Love in Paris is always unique, always fresh, and always a sensation we long for. For Piguet, Rue de Cirque was where the magic began. For the wearer, it is where love begins. And I should say, by the way, it says at the top of this press release that this is a permanent UK exclusive. Interesting. Um, and gosh, if you thought the price of the other one, so this is 100 mils for £220, apparently. So, and yeah, I was, I was going to say Smarks saying only America had speakeasies. I thought that was a very, very American term. I kind of questioned myself there, but I thought, OK, you're not a historian. Don't say anything. Um the charge for the creation of Rue de Cirque was to design something classic, but with a youthful appeal. The fragrance brief included words like floral, addictive, bright, romantic, sexy. 
The use of musk was an immediate consideration in that it imbues a skin-like warmth and sensuality. Ultimately, the core combination of woods, vetiver, and praline at the scent's base make the perfect pairing. With Paris's Rue du Cirque as a backdrop to this enticing scent, the formula winks to traditional French perfumery while leading a fresh journey for the fragrance pioneer. Um, Paroli says the prices on new releases have gone insane. I know. I, I mean, the, the prices of everything. The, I mean, you know, the prices of everything generally in life are going crazy, but for perfumes, I, I don't know. Is it by Aurelien Guichard, says Pradeep? I don't know. And I'm not sure the press release is going to tell us. We should try to find out. Rue de Cirque tickles as it, as it opens with a brilliant explosion of herbaceous bergamot and sweetly spicy nutmeg. The laughter immediately continues <laughs> into the sense of stunning floral heart, a combination of delicate lily of the valley, geranium and jasmine, I'm way off so far, for a final addictive abduction, an addictive abduction. Oh, I'm so addicted to you kidnapping me all the time. <laughs> the formula unfolds with white amber, sensual musk and Haitian vetiver, all temptingly accented by seductive praline. The effect is like a crush in a bottle. Um, so what are the notes? Bergamot, nutmeg, lily of the valley, geranium, gardenia, jasmine, sambac, sensual musk, white amber, patchouli, vetiver, and praline. Let's smell again. Let's see what is going on. Stockholm syndrome in a bottle. Thank you very much. We'll, that would have been a much better name for it, wouldn't it? Um, okay, I mean... Maybe I'm having a bad nose day, but Lily of the Valley, I'm not particularly thinking. No, Jasmine, I'm not particularly thinking. Musk and patchouli, yes, fine. Praline, I mean, nothing nothing as sweet as that. Um, let's go Let's go to the pre-sprayed one. Um, notes and press release make it sound underwhelming, but your description definitely livens it up a bit. I know, I mean, I, I, I actually, I want to wear this. I want, I want to test it out and wear it. Um, Maybe the idea was to bring all of those things together and, and make them quite abstract. Where is my Piguet? Oh, here we go. So this is the pre-sprayed one. <clears throat> okay, that, oh, that's got a nutty, interesting. That's got a kind of nutty feel to it, but not over sweet. So the praline has got a touch of just a, just a hint of maybe kind of some kind of vanillic sugariness. Which makes me think, okay, either this perfume takes you on a really interesting journey and the notes really do develop as it goes along, or the praline and the sweetness is something that will come out more prominently on skin. Um, which is yet another reason for me to give this a proper test drive and wear it. Um, and maybe the kind of interesting, slightly dry thing was what I was kind of seeing as the sort of interplay between the gardenia and, and the nutmeg. But it it's it's I think I think it's sort of quietness and restraint is 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 what I'm finding fascinating. And yeah, I guess I can detect a sort of hint of vetiver. Nothing is obvious here, okay? Nothing is immediately legible, overtly legible. It 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 does come together to create a very, very interesting kind of cohesive whole. It's it, it's curious. It's curious. And again, like I said, they will do these things where they don't mind being just a tiny little bit out there. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it's weird. I'm not saying it's 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 crazy and, you know, surreal. Um, but there are there are inflections in it which are just a little bit surprising. Now, does it make me think Paris? No. Does it make me think romance? No. Does it make me think youthful exuberance? No. I am reading it as still something darker, fleshier, maybe almost heading towards the kind of subtly vampiric, you know, a, a face that kind of grins and then you suddenly see that they've got these really, really, really sharp canine teeth. Um, you know, really, really crimson, scarlet, not not all not all light joie de vivre. It's actually more sophisticated than that, I think. Hmm. Fascinating. A crepuscular floral, says Christian, or Rachel says subtly vampiric. Fabulous. 
Yeah, interesting, interesting. Okay, let's move on, let's move on, because I absolutely want to make sure that we do the three remaining ones. Okay, let's go Miller Harris, because I haven't smelt that one either. So this is Black Datura, or Datura, Datura, from, from Miller Harris. Uh, I have never had the pleasure of smelling the flower itself. Um, I'm told that that can be quite a trippy experience, and I'm also reliably informed that they smell very, very pleasant, and they smell a little bit like honeysuckle. Um, so the Miller Harris, very, very, very hit and miss as a brand. Um, Let's pop that box there because we're running out of space a little bit, aren't we? Um, but but still always worth checking out if anybody wants to see the bottle. So this is this is this is meant to be a little bit of a departure or a change of direction for the brand. You know, doing something um, unlike the kind of thing they would normally do. How close to Datura Noir will this be? Sorry, did I actually call it Datura? No it, it is Black Datura. I must give it its its correct name. Okay, here we go. This one I haven't smelt before either, but I have pre-sprayed it, so we will see what it's like. And I have got a press release for it as well. How's the little bottle selection doing there? Oh no, you can't really see that one there, can you? Should, should we pop it on there? Is that better? Yeah. Ooh, that's interesting. Wow, okay. That's, that's like bizarrely medicinal to start with. Um. And that, 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 that bit's all gone. It was almost sort of mentholated, strangely eucalyptus-y. Ah, oh, that was strange. Some, somewhere like, something like violet leaf, but really kind of evil. There, there is, there's something dangerous about that opening, something really, really dangerous about the opening. Um, And then, and then what? Hard to describe. Um, not particularly overtly floral, and not obviously honeysuckle either. Maybe, maybe in that sense of being intoxicating. I mean, we happen to have a honeysuckle plant in the, in the garden. Um, so each year, when when the when the little flowers come out, I, I kind of try to smell them as often as possible and commit the smell to memory. Um, That's quite, that's quite hard to describe. There's something white floral about it. There's something really, really purple about it as well. Something quite goth, as opposed to gothic, you know. Um, it's really kind of like black nail varnish and gaunt white faces and frills and lace and black velvet. And ah, that, that's, that's fascinating. That's Properly fascinating. Um, let's leave that there for a bit. And again, we will. I will be very, very curious um, to see what the uh, pre-sprayed one is like. Black Datura, uh, new for September 2023. Black Datura Eau de Parfum is the latest statement sent to launch in Miller Harris's expertly curated private collection. An equally floral and woody perfume, the unisex fragrance has been inspired by the Datura, appropriately also known as Moonflower, a flower that opens in the evening. The scent leaves you feeling powerful and elegant, ready for night to unfold wherever it may take you. Trans <coughs> excuse me, uh, transporting the wearer into the night, this spellbinding rich scent starts with a dizzying swirl of tuberose and ylang ylang. Okay, but not again in an obvious way. You know, this isn't <coughs> tuberose criminelle or carnal flower. Dusted in bay rose whilst being enriched with musks, balsams, and the most hypnotic white lily. White florals, yeah, generally speaking. With fresh notes of incense and pink peppercorn to unveil seductive white flowers, the tuberose plays to the duality with its sensual and dangerous facets, while sophisticated notes of dark woods leave an intense trail guaranteed to turn heads. Would you like to know how much you would have to pay for this one? This is a this is a hundred mil bottle that would set you back a hundred and eighty pounds. Gosh, I wonder how many people are going to be getting perfume bottles under their Christmas trees this year. Uh, press release carries on. It says this is a London story, a, sto a city full of possibilities. An evening that starts with a taxi and no clue clue of where it's going. That's a taxi you need to get out of. 
The rest of the story is yours to write. A fragrance that is larger than life, a beacon of light in the darkness, leaving you feeling powerful, elegant, and ready for night to unfold. And then we've got a quote from the perfumer, who is uh, Emily Bouge. The starting point is the mesmerizing datura, beautiful and opulent, but poisonous at a high dosage. The perfume deals with its duality, reinforced by the contrast of black and white. Uh, danger and seduction, the pink peppercorn introduces a feminine and sensual tuberose that reveals a dangerous, captivating scent, and so on and so forth. What else can I tell you about it? I think nothing that is particularly worth reading, especially here, but just the notes. Tuberose, datura, pink peppercorn, ylang ylang, myrrh, peru balsam, incense, labdanum, musk amber, Chinese cedarwood, Haitian vetiver, and amaris. Um, and it says that it's available from September 2023 on millerharris.com. Um, what are you folks saying about it? Oh, Ty says, I'll wait until it reaches TK Maxx and I can get it for $29.99. Um, Stephen says, I really like the new setup for first sniff, press release, then dry down review. Well, thank you very much. Not that I especially, no, of course, I planned it. I did plan it that way. I, I totally did plan it that way. Um, Gavin says, I bought two recently from TK Maxx, and Natasha says that they do usually end up there. Well, maybe they will, maybe they won't. Um, right, let's get the pre-sprayed one. There we go. Right. So the real Datura flower smells a bit like honeysuckle. So I've been told, Rachel. Do you get any? Not particularly, no. Okay, let's try the one that is now, what, coming up to two hours ago, hour and a half. Okay, I'm thinking woody ambers, but but they've been quite well disguised so far, so th this is intriguing. This is intriguing. I don't I don't want to get all derogatory about it now because it's genuinely seems to be the, the dry down is is okay, is more woody amberish than I would have cared for. That could also be what they're calling the amaris. Um It's 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 definitely a very very woody dry down, yeah. And the dryness of the cedar wood comes through as well. Not especially overly musky. Maybe I can detect some incense there too. So I suppose the the, the journey, you know, kind of filling in the gaps before and after, is that it goes from something sharp, spiky, almost um, perhaps mentholated, which could be the tuberose, right, to something a bit more calmly white floral and then woods in the base. Um, and Rachel has, is asking a question that I need to say, I can't answer. How does it compare to the Serge Lutin's Datura Noir? I haven't smelt it for the longest time, so I really wouldn't like to say, sorry. Um, yeah, perhaps, perhaps overly woody in the base. It just makes it a little bit monodimensional, a little bit less interesting than the opening the opening based on the based on the evidence of you know what we've been talking about for the last few minutes the opening is more interesting than than the dry down okay and now let's move on to the third and final one that i haven't smelled before we will finish with the eris and, and i have had a quick sniff of it and i, I wanted to share it with you this is newish from l'artisan parfumeur uh, composed by christophe reynaud this is called cuir grena which i believe just translates as um, garnet leather, as in the, the, the stone, the mineral. Um, Natasha still saying uh, about, well, about the previous one, when they changed the Serge Lutin's packaging from the cream boxes to the to black, the old ones were all at TK Maxx. I wish I'd bought more than one bottle. Yeah, me too. Rachel says, Mr. P, I'm so, so, so thankful for your dry down impressions. Well, I'm glad. If they're working, then we'll carry on. It, it means that, you know, it certainly makes life easier for me at the other end, because it means I don't have to do um, the blotter impressions, and it means I can properly go away and think about some of the scents so that I can compose a few considered lines when I write about the video on persolays.com. So if, if it works, it works. Um, no one has commented on your shirt, says Gavin. I know, maybe everybody hates it. I don't know. Right. So this is part of their more expensive collection, you know, the collection where they've got the ouds and the Arabian scents. I think they call them Le, Le Merveille. Um, lovely shirt, says Ray. Oh, thank you for mentioning the shirt, Rachel. <laughs> um, so let's see what this one is like. Um, uh, and again, this is this is this is another um range that I should 
return to I should give this range some more time and also the um What's that? What's that? Is, is it the, 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 the botanical range? I forget what it's called. Still waiting for both Lattizar and Penhaligons to relaunch in Australia, says Woozy, after the Pooch acquisition. Gosh, have they not done that? Um, right, let's have a sniff of this. So, as I say, Christophe Renault, Cuir Grenat, um, which I have not smelled before, but I have pre sprayed. Let's see. Oh, okay. Right. I will be smelling... The, there isn't a press release for this one. I've just got a little bit of a blurb. I will be smelling the pre-sprayed one in a second. But first sniff is... This is Lartisan doing um, Tom Ford Tuscan leather. Um, yeah, very, very definitely. That is what the opening is. So the the kind of tart fruit opening, raspberry, strawberry, that kind of thing, going into a, I mean, you know, I, I love Tuscan leather, and Tuscan leather, as I've said many times before on this channel, is is very much a kind of throwback to Kinesia 10, which I also absolutely adore, that, 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 cla what is now a classic, classic, classic leather structure of that tart fruit at the top, sometimes not so detectable, sometimes more detectable, and then a really, really suave, not overly stinky tannery type leather um, and, 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 and a, just a sort of beautiful, simple, suede leathery, woody base. Um, and this is very much doing that kind of thing. Uh, this year from L'Artisan, I wasn't so crazy about the Soleil de Provence, but I was taken with their, um, their peach one. Now, what was that called? Um, that had a kind of punning name. Somebody will help me out. And people here are mentioning Mont de Narcisse, saying it's an underrated masterpiece. I really, really liked Mont de Narcisse, and I'm pretty sure I reviewed it fairly positively. So seek it out if you haven't already tried it. Um, Woozy says, can companies start copying stuff like Bondi and Cabochard instead of Tuscan leather? Fleur de Peche, says uh, Pradeep. Yeah, thank you very much. That I was taken with. And yeah, I totally agree with you, Woozy. You know, would, wouldn't it be great if they started copying... Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty sure Frederick Mal and Jean-Claude Ellen decided they wanted to do their own version of Poivre with their the latest one with Heaven Can Wait. Stephen says, was that leather and pomegranate? OK, so you can help me out here because I am i don't know what the French word for pomegranate is, but I don't think it's grenat. I think grenat is garnet, which now makes sense because I guess a garnet is coloured very, very similarly to a raspberry and it's kind of deeply, deeply red, dark red. Oh, Pradeep says pomegranate is grenade. Okay. Dark red leather, says Gavin. Yeah, it is, it is meant to be, I think. I think that's the idea, that it's a colour being added to leather. I mean, if you want, if you want another Tuscan leather for your collection, so far, this one is coming across really, really convincingly Tuscan leatherish. Um, let us just very, very, very briefly share the blurb with you. As I say, it's very, very short. Cuir Grenat is a fragrance where Christophe Reynaud explores the interplay between light and shadow with a duo of leather and raspberry, aiming for a fragrance that gives the sensation of touch. Why? The raspberry and leather can be seen as well as smelled. Okay. They are both aromas and scents, possessing unexpected... Well, hang on, what? They are both aromas and scents. Yes. Possessing unexpected oppositions and similarities. Um, okay. And that's the end of that blurb, except it's got a one-liner as well. A radiant leather with glimmers of amber adorns a powdery raspberry. And it is pretty diff diffusive. It is radiant. Um... Let's get the let's get the pre-sprayed one. Is that no no no? Where is my artisan? That's it. Okay. You got all the good blurbs today, says Pradeep. I know, I know. I got the good ones and the ones that weren't bad. Did you see what I did there? Aroma and scent. Um. Yeah, Tuscan leather. Tuscan leather with. With less substance to it on this blotter, it has to be said, and maybe a touch angrier, because Tuscan leather, I, th I think, is is one of the most suave of modern releases. Rachel says, "My husband works in the leather industry." 
please follow that up with something else because now we're <laughs> thinking, <laughs> what are you going to tell us now? Are you, you're going to say, um, oh, hang on, hang on. I didn't see the comment beforehand. Rachel says, in olden times, pomegranate juice was used to dye leather. Fascinating. The acid helps to release the natural dyes in your leather, making them easier to absorb and longer lasting. Uh -huh. Okay, at least there is a, a kind of connection there. Um, I'm sure leather is a fascinating industry, says Gavin. Stop. Stop, stop, stop picturing Rachel's husband like that, you rude man. <laughs> um yeah it, it it's interesting um but it, it doesn't quite reach the same heights at least here as um as as as, as tuscan leather and and kinesia 10 but but i'm gonna wear this i am going to wear this and see and see how it goes um <laughs> why do you think i married him says rachel oh okay she can give us she good as she gets right <laughs> Enough banterism here. Let's go on to the latest from Barbara Herman's brand, Eris. All of her perfumes so far, as you know, have been composed by Antoine Lee. She very, very kindly came on here a little while ago to talk about her brand. Antoine Lee has talked about her brand. And I think, was it earlier this year that we had Scorpio rising from her? Or am I, or am I getting my years completely mixed up? Anyway, this is a Delta of Venus all of the perfumes you know this this if if, if, there, if there is a brand out there that you need to try that you haven't tried before then eris needs to be really 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 high up on on towards the top of your list of must try brands all of the perfumes have got something really really interesting to offer they all to to, to varying degrees bring out um barbara herman's deep love for and and um very, very, very profound knowledge of vintage perfumery. She is, after all, the author of this book, which you can't quite see here, Scent and Subversion, which is a kind of guide to vintage scents and classic scents. Um, uh, green Spell is, 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 you know, is an absolute must try for them. You know, you really, really do need to check them out. Scorpio, was it Scorpio Rising or Scorpion Rising, Sister Parfum? I can't remember, but that, yeah, that, that, was a, that was a very, very interesting sandal woody type scent. This one I have had an initial sniff of before, but it was a very, very, very quick sniff because I just couldn't, couldn't um, resist spraying it. And I was surprised because this is, let's, um, let's spray. This is rather unexpectedly and surprisingly fruity, uh, with shades of a perfume that we reviewed just the other day here, shades of the new Tutti Twili from Hermes. Sharon says Delta Venus is great for summer, especially the excessively hot summer we're having in Texas this year. Um, who makes Belle de Jour, says Gavin. That, that's, that's Eris and that's Antoine Lee. And yeah, it, you know, I, I, if, if I had to kind of, choose my personal, personal favorite scent types, then fruity would not be amongst them. But absolutely, there is a place for fruity scents. And there is, you know, there is a there is a really, really awful, unconvincing, crass, overly synthetic way of doing them. And then there is this way of doing them, where the fruit feel like they're pre being presented to you in a way you hadn't experienced whilst being um, true to life and convincing. And this is I, I know because I've read the note, this is this is meant to be guava, and I would say that it is, you know, and it and it's similar to those sorts of fruits. So you might kind of get a, a hint of mango, you might get a hint of something like papaya, um, you know, what 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 tend to be called exotic fruit, except except in the countries where they come from, where they're just called fruit. Um and it's it's orange hued and sweet and sugary, but is also green. And I think this is why some of these scents work when they work, because a, the, a skilled perfumer comes along and says, look, you can't just overdose on the fruity, sugary, sickly stuff. You need to put in some contrast. And I think that's what makes it work here, because there's something really quite sharply green, fascinatingly green about it, which just lifts the whole and stops it sink, from sinking into this morass of sugariness and sweetness. Um, Delta Venus is lovely, says Crystal. And what else? I'm getting something that I can't quite put my finger on, which I love. I love it when a, when a perfume just kind of keeps making me want to smell it more. Um, is it 
it's almost like a kind of leafy, slightly jasminey kind of feel. And what impressions am I getting from it? So this is, you know, we talked about something being subtly vampiric earlier. This is, this is, I think, on 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 the outside, the the fresh faced, um, ingenue, uh, you know, who who's got who is not wearing any makeup or is wearing the kind of natural look makeup and is just standing with her blonde hair blowing in the wind by the side of a, of a beautiful crystal clear lake. But actually all of that is a deception because, because she's got real, real power to draw you in and to pull you in. And if you're not careful, you will end up at the bottom of that lake of ice with her. I think it's, it's the, the, there's a very fascinating duality here. It's, it's kind of ice queen, but it's not, um, so again, to go back to comparing it to the Hermès, the Hermès also starts with that fruity note, but it completely goes off in the direction of being really playful and effervescent and full of um, youthful joie de vivre and insouciance. So th th this is th th this has got a, a, a completely different feel to it. Um, I haven't I haven't seen Frozen, but it's kind of making me think a little bit of, of the Elsa character in Frozen. Barbara, if you're watching this video, I mean that as a compliment, okay? I do not want to kind of do, belittle your perfumes by comparing them to Disney princesses, but you know what I mean? Somebody who's on the face of it looks as though um, they're the quintessence of innocence and, and prettiness, but actually maybe they're anything but. Um, very, very, very brief bit of information here, just a little booklet not a booklet, leaflet, uh, a guava-centric floral that reimagines the Garden of Eden's forbidden fruit. Okay, so there you go. So so, so it, it is dangerous. Morphing into a psychedelic kaleidoscope of carnal tropical fruit notes. Yes, totally, completely. Um, Gavin says, can we at least discuss that the perfume is named after a euphemism for vulva? We, 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 you can discuss it amongst yourselves. We do all know that, Gavin says, Stephen. Yeah, we don't have to discuss it. And the notes are Italian bergamot, American grapefruit, Iranian galbanum, the green note, Egyptian violet leaf, yeah, something leafy, Egyptian jasmine, jasminey, uh, Haitian vetiver, sandalwood, and a guava accord with um, Antoine Lee being the perfumer. Yeah, and, and okay. So now this is an example of something that you read and you can totally smell what you read in the scent itself. It's, it starts off innocent, but then it's anything but. And it is, it is, it is quite strange. It is quite strange. Anyway, let's go to the pre-sprayed one to see what it is doing. Here we go, Delta Venus. Um, Innocence and falling into sin in the same story. Fascinating, says Rachel. Yeah, and it, it, it the dry down is still quite strange. I wonder, the next time I get a chance to communicate with Barbara or with Antoine Lee, I will sort of say to them, was the challenge to, to keep it weird, to keep it just slightly off-center? Because um, you think you're sort of smelling a dry sandalwood, but then you get a sort of weird fruity inflection. Um, Maybe something vetty there like fascinating. Not everyone is going to be able to pull this off, I don't think. Um, but those those who will will, I think, end up smelling really, really curious and hard to classify. This is going to be one of those head turners, I think. Um hmm, well done, Barbara. Well done, Antoine. Okay, and when the, well done all of you for sticking around. Till the end of this video. Thank you very much for watching. Um, shall we have a quick sniff of all of them again? All right, let's do let's do the Dior. Yeah, the Dior. The Dior, Dior is now coming across as quite sweet, pleasant, pleasant, unremarkable. The Piguet. The Piguet is still kind of interesting. That's also doing a sort of I'm not going to be overly approachable, overly accessible thing. Which one's this? This is the, the L'Artisan, yeah, Dusk and Leather, uh, and the Datura. Yeah, very, very woody, perhaps overly so. Okay, thank you very much for watching. Stay tuned to social media for details of new videos coming your way. Be good, and I will see you very, very soon.
Bye now.